Yeah. All right. So we're, we're going to be in the book of Philemon. If you want to go ahead and turn there. It's a, uh, it's a letter by Paul, closely linked with the letter to Colossae, because Philemon lived in that church, that town. And before we get into it, you know, when we read the Bible, no matter who we are, we, we bring something to our reading of the Bible. Nobody is a perfectly objective reader of the Bible. We bring our personal experiences, what we've read, what we've learned, what we've been taught. And so we come to the Bible having to deal with something called confirmation bias. We know about this in psychology. The confirmation bias is this universal human phenomenon that your brain is primed to pay attention to things that confirm what you already believe, to interpret things to fit what you already believe, and to ignore stuff that goes against what's already up here. And so that's one of the good reasons to read multiple translations, multiple commentaries, people from different denominations, backgrounds, even, even reading, because there are atheist scholars of the Bible, not because I want to agree with them, but I want information that's going to challenge the way I'm already predisposed to think. And it's uncomfortable when your confirmation bias is challenged. You experience what's called cognitive dissonance, and it doesn't feel good inside. But if we always come to the Bible expecting to feel good, uh, we're going to be disappointed, and we're probably going to miss out on a lot of opportunities for growth and transformation. So before we read... I want to remind us of one thing. Whenever you see Christ in the Bible, that is not a name. It's not Jesus' first name, middle name, last name. It's not a nickname, okay? It's a title. The, the Greek equivalent of Messiah. And now even that is challenging because Messiah already has quite a bit of um, cultural baggage, when we think of Messiah figure, we immediately think of salvation, being saved. But Christ, Messiah, that term is actually king. And so I encourage you, when, whenever you read the Bible in the New Testament, and in particular today, when you see Christ, try replacing it with king. So when it says Jesus the Christ, you would say Jesus the king. Or if it says Christ Jesus, you would say King Jesus. Scott McKnight says it this way. What God does in sending the Son is to establish Jesus as the Messiah, which means king. And God established in Jesus the king, the kingdom of God, which means the king is ruling in his kingdom. And you're about to see, we're going to read all of Philemon together. You're going to see a major part of the gospel acted out and embodied. You're going to see imitation of the ideal king. The king who gives his law and then perfectly embodies his law. And you're going to see Paul imitating that king. And calling other people to do the same. So let's read Philemon. It says, Paul, a prisoner for King Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apia our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ, the King, to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an older man and now a prisoner also for King Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Anesimus whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. 
I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this is perhaps why he was parted from you, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant or slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. Especially to me, but now much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. And if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge it to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of you owing me your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I will write, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I hope, I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my follow, fellow prisoner in the Christ Jesus, King Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus the King, be with your spirit. So some backstory. Philemon is likely a, a wealthy Roman, not Jewish, convert who leads a house church in the city of Colossae. Apphia is probably his wife. Archippus is probably their son. So this is a very personal letter. This is a letter written directly to Philemon, not a letter written to a whole church. And so in all likelihood, you see in verse 19, Philemon had probably been converted by Paul sometimes in the past. And Onesimus was a runaway slave. Philemon slave. Most likely, Onesimus did something like steal from Paul and run off. Took something from Paul, caused him trouble, ran away. Somehow, we we don't know exactly what the circumstances were. He crossed paths with Paul. Maybe he had heard of Paul through Philemon. Maybe he didn't, but he crossed paths with Paul And he was converted and became a Christian and was now ministering to Paul as Paul was imprisoned in Ephesus. So Paul's imprisoned. This individual gets converted. Paul views him as he's my son in the Lord. And then he realizes, oh, this, I know his owner. I preached to and converted Philemon. And now at this point, Paul is sending him back to Philemon. When we see the gospel, not merely as a plan of salvation, but the gospel is Jesus is king. The gospel is Jesus is king who is ushering in a new humanity, a new creation, a new way of living, a new way of being. It's going to have far reaching implications for all parts of our life, especially our, our social lives. And I don't mean social as in you know, having fun, friends. I mean, social is in how we interact with people, how we view people. God works through people and processes over time to bring changes about. And often it takes time for us to realize the full implications of the gospel as it works its way out in in our lives. Just like it took Philemon time to realize the full implications of the gospel for his life. Verse six is probably really important to start with. N.T. Wright's translation is this. My prayer is this, that the partnership which goes with your faith may have its powerful effect in realizing every good thing that is at work in us to lead us into the king. This word partnership or fellowship is a rich word, koinonia. And this is definitely not about evangelism as in sharing your faith. It's more about being involved together in the gospel. What Paul is praying for is that the partnership which he and Philemon share in under Christ in the gospel will be productive. 
that it's going to have the effects that it's meant to, which is far more than just individual salvation. I get to go to heaven one day when I die. You know, that, that idea of like, well, the gospel is I get to go to heaven when I die if I trust Jesus. That's not false, but it's a distortion. Probably kind of coming out of our own highly individualistic culture that we live in, which is all about me and what, how, do, how do I get this benefit? What do I need? My personal salvation. The goal of the gospel is the spread of King Jesus' reign. And entering under that reign has the benefit of forgiveness of sins. That has to be necessary. In order to come into God's kingdom, we have to have our sins forgiven. So don't think that I'm ever saying I'm not for salvation or salvation by faith and grace. That's not what I'm saying. That's the plan of salvation. The gospel is Jesus is king. When we're brought into his kingdom, we're made as workers. You'll notice that's the kind of language that Paul is using when he's talking with Philemon, his fellow co-workers, fellow soldiers, we're made workers in this kingdom. And this kingdom has a goal and we are partners in that goal, partners with God and partners with each other. And this goal goes all the way back to the first three chapters of the Bible in Genesis, this Edenic ideal you'll see there. We don't have time to read it, but if you go back and look in Genesis, what you're going to see is God sets up the world and he creates humans and he gives us a very particular vocation, which is to display his nature and bring his rule to all of creation. And that's what humans were created for, to reflect God's glory and to share in his authority, partnering with him to rule all of creation. And we muck it up really quickly. And that's a major element of the gospel is that in Jesus, the king, this is now back on track. The king is now doing what we were always meant to do, but couldn't. He's perfectly embodying that. And this partnership that we have in the gospel is meant to have a powerful effect. When disciples work together, God uses them as channels for his creative life-giving power. To make new things or make things new. Good things. New ways of living and being. This is eternal life now. The the age, the life of the age to come is breaking in through Jesus and through his people now. So Paul begins by basically saying, hey, I'm praying that this sharing in the gospel that you have is going to work its full effect. Paul is very delicately building up to a request he's going to make to Philemon that probably in that culture and time would be a jaw dropper. And this is an experiential knowledge. He's he's talking about like, you're going to come to know the knowledge of Jesus, but this is an experiential knowledge. There's some things that we can only learn about God and Jesus by living and imitating. No amount of Bible study is going to teach it to us. We only learn it as we follow in his footsteps. It reminds me in my own experiences, this is cliche, but it's true. Becoming a father taught me things experientially about God that I just would have never gotten. Never. When Kyla was born, our our first child, she's coming up on two years old. It was hard. It was a huge challenge. God used her to reveal all kinds of issues in my character, all kinds of sin and selfishness. People and process over time. God uses people and processes to change us, to mold us. And I prayed regularly while I was with my daughter, God, may I be with her as you are with me. Turn my relationship with my daughter into a sacrament so I can experience your grace and and holiness and who you are through this relationship. And so... Paul is kind of setting this up like, hey, I want you to grow in your knowledge of Christ. And there's only one way you're going to be able to do it. I'm going to ask you to do something really difficult. And one of the most important ways that we need to be transformed is how we relate to other human beings. Paul uses familial language throughout this letter. Brother. Sister, he calls Onesimus, my son. 
Once we're brought into the kingdom of God, there really is only one way, one appropriate way to relate to other believers. That's as family, as kin. Anismus ran away as a slave and a thief. When he met Paul, he gave allegiance to King Jesus and he was elevated to family. And that's the creative act in salvation. Right? Salvation is not just a change in forensic stature. You were legally considered guilty. Now God declares you legally innocent. Salvation is about the implantation of newness within our hearts and minds. Heaven infiltrating into our very lives. And so as Paul interacts with Onesimus, he realizes, man, something needs to be done here. There needs to be forgiveness and reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus. And Paul sends Onesimus back. You read the first part of the letter and he's, Paul's not being manipulative. He's telling the truth about how he sees Philemon. You are loving. You love Jesus. You love the saints. You've been encouraging. It's, you're refreshing to the church. I've been praying for you. And Philemon might be feeling pretty good. And then he gets to where, where Paul says, and I'm sending Anismus back to you. I want you to welcome him back as your brother. And how Philemon must have felt. Who, who knows? I'm sure that was one of those like, wait, what? Come again? This does not compute. Our need for reconciliation isn't just with God. It's also needed with other humans. When you read the Bible story closely. Sin alienates us from humans just as much as it does from God. Humans have been fractious all of our history. All of our history. And this is why Jesus has to be more than just a personal savior. God doesn't want a bunch of individually saved loners. He wants a kingdom, a family, a people. So loner salvation just isn't on the table. It isn't. And what we're seeing here in this this short letter is the gospel and the cross being enacted. Interestingly, it's, it's, I think, maybe Paul's only writing where he doesn't mes- m- mention the crucifixion. Because he doesn't have to. He's showing it. He's showing it and how he, you'll read in there, he takes on Onesimus' debt. He says, hey, I'm sending him back to you. I want you to you two to relate to each other as brothers in the Lord now as family. And if he owes you anything, if he has cost you anything, put it on my account. I'll take care of it. So Paul is, is taking the debt that Onesimus owed Philemon, according to that culture onto himself so that he can reconcile those two people together. It's the cross being embodied right before our eyes. If you look in verse 8 and 9, Paul believed that what he was asking Philemon to do was, if I want to make up a word, commandable. Paul thought what he was asking Philemon to do, he was able to command. He says, I I could. I could command you, but I'm not going to. I could order you. It's a strong word. That's the same word that when Jesus commands the unclean spirits. Same Greek word. When Jesus commands the storm and says, stop, same word. When Herod orders the execution of John the Baptist, same word. Paul is saying, hey, I have the authority and this is right. I could command you, but because of love, I appeal to you. And whose love? Paul's. Paul and Philemon's love for each other. Paul and Onesimus' love for each other. Paul and Jesus' love for each other? Jesus and Onesimus' love? Or Onesimus and Philemon's love? He's appealing to love. And I would say the answer is yes, all of those. If you could diagram it out, drawing some arrows, God, Philemon, Paul, Onesimus, drawing arrows of love, 
linking them all together. The question then is, will Philemon love Onesimus in action? If Paul had commanded it, it would have been under compulsion. And if it was under compulsion, it wouldn't have been an act of love. And that's what Paul was wor- working towards. How can there be reconciliation if there's no love? Paul wanted a true act of love, not duty. And it reminds us that what God wants is reformation of the hearts over revolution against social structure. The Jesus, the disciples, the apostles, they never tried to overthrow Rome. They tried to change people's hearts. Imagine how incredibly faithful Paul was in all of this. Paul's faith trusting the allegiance of these two men. Their faithfulness to, to God. See, the, the Roman Empire ran on slavery ran on slavery. Every ancient culture in the world has practiced some form of slavery through conquest or debt for all of human history. And the Roman empire was no different. Slaves who ran away could be punished pretty much. However, the owner wanted to beat them, brand them with a hot iron showing that they had run away, kill them. And if you harbored a runaway slave, you could be held legally and financially liable. So Paul is in a sticky situation and he has to handle it with tact. And he sends Philemon or sends Onesimus to Philemon, trusting that Onesimus is not going to run away again. And trusting that Philemon is going to receive him in the love of the Lord. What incredible faith. It reminds me in in Ephesians chapter four, it says, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ, the King from him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And this is not a, just a warm, fuzzy love. This is a love in action. This is a love and decision-making. This is a love and self-sacrifice. Paul is lovingly, gently, tactfully pointing Philemon towards this truth. And the truth is, is that in Christ, there is no division. There is no other way to see each other in Christ than as family members. We read it in Colossians. Colossians chapter three, and having put on the new self, which is being renewed and the knowledge in the image of its creator here, there is no Gentile or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, no barbarian, no Scythian, no slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If you have, and if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So what if, what if Paul or uh, Philemon had read the letter to Colossians first in the house church? Reading that very passage, hey, there's no, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, slave, free, man, woman. It's Christ and all. See each other as one family. And then he opens the personal letter. And basically Paul's like, all right, I, I preached it to you in, in the first letter. Now Philemon, I'm actually seeing if you're going to do it. Will you see Anismus as your brother in Christ? Or will you continue to see him the way your culture has defined him? your slave and your property. So we've put on this new self, this new humanity, and none of the old distinctions matter anymore because Christ is everything. And in all of us, all are part of one body. And imagine one part of your body saying, "Ugh, I despise you to another part of the body. It's silly. It makes no sense. In reality, that's cancer. That's disease. When one part of the body attacks another part of the body, we have a whole classification of diseases for us, autoimmune disorders. It makes no sense.
N.T. Wright says, you know, Paul doesn't mention the cross here. Rather, he applies it. On the cross, Jesus hung with arms outstretched between heaven and earth, making a bridge upwards and downwards between God and the human race and from side to side between all the warring factions of earth. And Paul has grasped the truth that so many have missed. His, God's achievement of reconciliation is put into effect when his people follow the same pattern. When people allow the cross too to shape their own lives, the love of God is set free to change and heal in ways we cannot at the moment even imagine. Verse 21, Paul hints at more. Most likely what Paul's saying here is, hey, not only do I trust that you're going to welcome him back as your brother, I trust you'll do the right thing, which is to set him free. And you might ask, well, why didn't Paul or God or Jesus directly attack slavery? We have a few minutes. I doubt I can do this justice, but I'll, I'll try to share some of my perspectives. Just because something is in the Bible doesn't mean the Bible endorses it. You have to read the biblical stories and contextualize them into the history and culture that they were first written in. You have to look at the broader picture. The Bible doesn't endorse slavery. But what Paul was asking Philemon to do was unheard of, completely against the status quo social structure that they were all living in. And if you think about the situation of the early church, Paul's in prison at this point with the potential to go to Rome to try and prove, hey, we are not a threat to the empire. I'm not a threat. The church is not a threat. What happens if people start to get word, oh, this new religious group is against slavery? What if a bunch of slaves realize that and they, they have an uprising? Probably untold amount of death and probably the greatest army and power in the world at the time coming to squash out the church. And so Paul's having to be very tactful here. And in all likelihood, if they just got rid of all slavery, and I'm, I don't want to justify, think of it this way. If we decided tomorrow fossil fuels are bad, we're not going to try and phase them out. We're going to eliminate them. What do you think would happen? How many millions of people would die when couldn't drive, couldn't get to the hospital, we don't have anything to run the electricity, everybody in a hospital that's on life support, gone. Everything that you use that includes plastic, plastics made from fossil fuels, gone. Right? Millions and millions, maybe billions of people would die. That's a similar situation in the Roman Empire if they were just like, no slaves, okay, Food production, gone. Millions of people would starve to death like that. And so Paul has to navigate this in a way where he is planting seeds for what the Edenic ideal is, how we are supposed to view our fellow humans and our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, but he has to do it in a way that's not going to get the Roman Empire coming to try and squash them all out for uprooting and causing a major upheaval. And this reminds me when Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It starts small. And it leads to great change. The leaven has to work its way all through the dough. And that takes time. We have to wonder, why did this one letter... This personal letter, not a letter to a church. Why did this, per surely Paul had written lots of personal letters. 
And this one tiny little personal letter made its way into the Bible. I think it's because of the veiled messages about things like human equality, brotherhood, and slavery. It points towards a particular direction. Progress is incompatible with an atheistic worldview. A materialistic, reductionistic, atheistic worldview has no room for progress and no foundation to say slavery is wrong. Mistreatment of, there's, there, in fact, you could probably make a good case from a, a Darwinian point of view that at sometimes slavery would be better for the human race. If it allows us to propagate and survive, that's what an atheistic worldview teaches. It's all about the survival of the species. We see in here the seeds of progress, the reformation of people's hearts working its way through the gospel, the, the king embodying his self-sacrificial love, and then Paul calling the brothers to do the same. See this person not as a slave, not as a foreigner, a Jew, a Gentile, a man, a woman, Republican, Democrat, black, white, native-born, immigrant. None of those are acceptable within God's body, within Jesus' body. And so as we get ready to close, maybe to ask ourselves, what is the primary lens that I view people? The primary lens through which I relate to people? Do I view people as within the body as family? Is that the first way? I view people in the church, family? And is the first way I view people in the outside church, potential family? Or do I look through a different lens? The lens of the other. You can decide whatever that that other is for you. We all do it. You can also ask yourself, where is there unforgiveness in my heart? I would imagine... There's a reasonable likelihood that Philemon had some unforgiveness for Onesimus, and Onesimus probably had some unforgiveness for Philemon. And even more so, where is reconciliation needed in my life? You can forgive someone and not be reconciled to them. This was a really hard thing for me to study because I started to realize, like, oh, I have some people, I think I've forgiven them, but I haven't reconciled. I haven't tried to reconnect with them. I just know I don't hold anything against them anymore, but we're not reconciled. God wants a family. Nothing recently has made me more happy than seeing my two daughters love each other, hold each other's hands in the stroller, play with each other. The little one smiles at her big sister like nothing else. Can you imagine the heartbreak God feels when he sees his children biting and tearing each other apart, whether in word or deed, and refusing to reconcile in their hearts? That's what we see being worked out here in this letter. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful love and grace, generosity. We thank you for the peace and the joy that we get to have in Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that his example would mold us, shape us, change us. That we would learn to see people and view people and trust people, treat people exactly the way that you do, God. Help us to say no to the old man, the flesh, the sinful part of us that kicks and screams against your will and to say yes to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.